you will think exactly what I want you to think. This mind control. Just 
Okay, I'm just going to scroll through all these books here from a distance so that you can see that all of these books have been read several times, annotated, uh, um, underlined, marked, and marked. And one of the most difficult things about doing this video was just locating all these books and all my totes and, and figuring out what I had and what I, what, I didn't, what I couldn't find. There's a couple of books that I would have loved to have featured. And at the... Uh, with the very last episode, I'm actually going to be showing the books that I that I culled for for this video, and so we're going to just go back over here to the beginning, and I'm going to explain just a little bit of give a little bit uh, a, a brief of some of the um, the books that I'm not using, and because they are still very interesting, and I can explain them. This is a my, my libraries are touch sensitive. In other words, you touch the book, and I can tell you what's in it. Uh, and that's in all of these. Uh, any any book in my library, I've read thousands and thousands of books. I am a fast reader, and like I say, many of these have been read two, three, four, five times. And and I've had them so many over probably three quarters of these for decades. I mean, thirty thirty years plus. And so I'm going to point this one out here. Philip Drew Administrator, this is a reprint, and it's from, um, uh, the original was from 1912. Edward, uh, Edward Mandel House, who, who was an advisor to uh, President Woodrow Wilson. And in it is, uh, it's, it's just a fascinating book, um, if, but it gives in, on, I believe it's page 238, starts the new national constitution. So if you're wanting to think what the communist constitution is for the United States, it is in this book. And uh, laid out all the articles, everything. And to my knowledge, it hasn't changed any. And so also, one of the main um, crooked politicians in this book, now remember, 1912, he's actually uh, secretively recording many of the uh, the lawyers, politicians, and administrators who come into his office. He records them with a dictograph on, I guess, these plastic uh, reels or so. And I think that's fascinating that they were doing that back in the early 1900s, recording. You have to assume that everything you say in these public uh, places is being recorded by someone for some reason. Next is uh, Secret Societies. Uh, by Nesta Webster. It is also a reprint. The original um, was, I believe, 1940, uh, no, 1924. And the two guys on uh, Edge of Wonder, they did an excellent, excellent video series on communism. And I urge anyone to check that out. It's a little lengthy, but their, their, their delivery is so wonderful. And they they get they get everything right, and and I was surprised that they put that out. But they go into a lot of Nesta Webster, and this is the only Nesta Webster book that I have. They don't show the actual books like I'm doing. This is a continuation of what they show. Here's another book I'm not using, you Gentiles. This is a book here called Germany Must Perish. It is a reprint, and this is an Elizabeth Dilling book, uh, The Octopus here, and what it is is it's all about these guys right here. And their origin, what they do, everything about them—it's—it's—it's it's, it's pretty its its pretty hardcore, pretty hardcore. And next we have uh, the Hidden Persuaders by Packard, and it—it's—it's uh, uh, it's from the 1950s, and and it goes into how uh, different companies realized that they had to have psychologists and psychiatrists. So they had to infiltrate the universities to turn out these psychiatrists and psychologists to figure out what people, what Americans liked and didn't like. And 
and they they designed food covers, uh, food wrappers, uh, cars, of, of home appliances, the furnitures, decors, all kinds of things of that nature. And anyone who is a psychiatrist or, or a psychologist, they can't be your friend. They have an open gateway to the unsuspecting person, to your mind. And that's what it's all about. A lot of psychiatrists and psychologists become... Uh, um, uh, field testing uh, uh, agents for different um, covert government companies. They become debriefers. They know how to get to the core stem of your mind. And they know how to just totally make you irritated and mad also. And um, by Condon, the Manchurian candidate, and uh, this is, um, uh, that's pretty much how, how it is. And, yep. And, Ezra Pound by Macmillan and Sons. It's published by Macmillan and Sons this year. And it's a funny thing that Macmillan and Sons, they publish so many things, uh, books, that are completely against what Ezra Pound was, was uh, uh, coming up with. I mean, just absolutely uh, the opposite direction, which I find amusing that Macmillan, oh, we're going to promote Ezra Pound as we step on you. And this next one here, um, uh, this difficult individual, Ezra Pound, and this is by Eustace Mullins. Now, Ezra Pound was one of Eustace Mullins' mentors. Eustace Mullins was one of my personal mentors, and many other people that I knew also. And so, just give you some connection there. And this is Masters of Deceit by Jedgar. And I'm calling him Jedgar for obvious reasons. And you know, a lot of the bad stuff that came out about Jedgar all came out after he died. It didn't come out while he was alive. I wonder why. But the book is its not a good read. It's its quite repetitive. And uh, 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 if he, I can't figure if he was red-pilled or not. But if he was, he realized that there wasn't anything he could do about it. There's just nothing he could do. And this is another uh, book by uh, Stormer, uh, The Death of a Nation. He was a preacher from uh, Missouri. And I'm not using it. Uh, to me, it's not as good as... Uh, uh, none, none dare call it treason. And here's uh, Mullen's new history and uh, that I'm not using. And here's a book here, uh, the AIC. AIC, The Myth and the Madness. And this is such a, 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 a prov provocative book because it is all, oh, the clowns, they're so ridden by bureaucracy. The paperwork is endless, and they have to work so much overtime, and they don't get paid for it. And, and they have to go and, and do these, do these hard, bad, horrible things. And the, the, the first couple of chapters in this book are just, you, you, once you read those two, you realize that the book is nothing but a sham. It is an absolute sham. Next is a reprint of a book called Verboten, which is extremely controversial. And... Um, um, next, I have Coup d'etat in America, and this book goes into uh, what happened to uh, uh, President KFJ in Dallas, and that's not my thing, uh, uh, how, how he passed away, or was passed away, but I'm going to show a lot of that and how it comes into being, and, and you'll see how if you don't play ball like we want you to play ball, you get um, you get thrown out of the court. <laughs> so, okay, now, um, next I've got um, uh, Des Griffin here, uh, Fourth Reich of the Rich, and I also had uh, Descent into Slavery and a couple of other uh, of his books, but this to me was one of the books that, uh, uh, that I really enjoyed, that really uh, put me on the horse, slapped it on the rear, and sent, sent me down the trail at a full gallop. This book is one of them. And, and I highly recommend it, highly recommend it, because it mentions in it a lot of these previous books. And, uh, and I find that good, because when, when, when you have a book that refers back to other books you have, I, I, I think that's special. Next is Lenin the Revolutionary, printed in Moscow in 1980. And it's translated by a lady named Liv Tudge. Liv Tudge worked for the American consulate in Moscow, and I believe she worked in a couple of others, but you can't find out anything about her hardly because she was an interpreter and a translator, and those are the people who were especially, especially secretive and, 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 and just put, uh, put in, into um, total seclusion, whatever. They knew everything. They knew everything. They sat in on the meetings with heads of states. And here we're coming into my Jack Moore books, um, and uh, I, I'd met Jack Moore on several occasions, 
and uh, I'm going to be showing how they were how they were uh, signed, and uh, and 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 give you some more. Of, uh, there's one book in here that I'm going to be of his that he uh, edited and annotated that I'm going to be pulling from heavily. It's going to have its own, maybe its even own section, and it's excellent, excellent. And you will see why I have all these books. And like I say, it was so hard to find all these books going through my totes. Uh, I, I keep my books in three different buildings. And, and these are books that I have never used in any presentation. Next is Eustace Mullins' uh, first rendition of, of The World Order. And, um, and it's, it's great. I've got it signed here, and, and I'm not going to be using it. But here we have Jared Crawford, The Last Battle Cry. And this is another book I got from uh, my longtime dear friend Frank uh, down in uh, Sanford, Florida. And I got a couple other books in here that I'm going to be using from him also. And uh, it is perhaps one of the most controversial books in this collection. And this is uh, Ralph Epperson, The Unseen Hand. And I believe that's another book I got from uh, Frank. And Epperson wrote, it's a great book. He also wrote about the, the World Order. And, and he had several other books, and they were all great. This is the only one I have now. But I had like two or three more. Merchants of Treason I'm not going to be using. And... This is a book about um, um, all the people who have made money off selling American secrets. If you wonder, like, how many, all these people that uh, all of a sudden America gets the, uh, gets the H-bomb and then two, three years later Russia gets it. Well, it's because all the papers, everything, there's some good documentaries about it. But these books go into detail. And uh, one of the, that they mentions all these extreme communists and socialists that were in our government. And how they just all tried to say it. it was all about themselves, all about themselves, and and it's just absolutely pathetic. Now, in this piece of plastic here, I have a burned up book, but it's it's worth saving. It's, it's one of, one of my original copies. It's called The Two Faces of George Bush. It's written by Anthony Sutton, and uh, a lot of people don't even know how the Bush family made their money. <laughs> so, and and he was president, vice president for eight years, and president for four for four years, and his son also served a double term. And here's another Eustace Mullins, original, uh, Rape of Justice, and it's a signed book, so I'll be showing that, but I'm not using it. Uh, by Way of Deception, it's written by a, uh, uh, a Mossad uh, fellow, and it, it's, it's, it's just strange where they built these, built, they, it's unbelievable some of the things that the Israeli intelligence uh, agency goes through just to catch one guy, just to catch one guy. And uh, here's another Eustace Mullins book that's signed that I'll be, um, I'll be featuring. Uh, Secrets of the Federal Reserve is another signed Eustace Mullins. And then you have America the Conquered by uh, Pastor Pete Peters. And, and uh, Betrayal of America. And then America, What Went Wrong. So these three books here, along with Merchants of Treason, they all came out real close together. And they're all kind of like the same thing. It's the, the politicians that have sold our country out and made a fortune, made a killing, and plus just got their, their, uh, uh, their jollies of debauchery just absolutely fulfilled many times over. Um, the next book I'm showing here is another sign, Eustace Mullins. This is second edition of, uh, of, uh, of, of The World Order. And here's one here by uh, James Bovert. Lost Rights, and this is a book that you can judge by its cover. Yes, yes, and it's uh, it's a little lengthy, but it does get the point across. Very good, very good. And the next book here is by Dr. James Wardner. Now, Dr. Wardner, he was a dentist, and he lived in Titusville. And I had met him on several occasions. He had actually come to my library, and he borrowed several of my books from time to time. He would visit uh, occasionally with his uh, charming wife, beautiful woman. I think her name was Carol or Carolyn, and he passed away a few years ago. And, uh, I, and I met him right after he wrote this book, and he, he was working on another book called um, Unholy Alliances. That's it. That's it. And this is another book here, uh, the second book written by this fellow here concerning the Israeli intelligence. See, the, the other one was by way of deception. This is called The Other Side of Deception. And here we have Pandora's Box, which has got a lot of information in it. And you can skip over the first 30 pages or so, which is kind of strange, but a good read. But this lady did a lot of research in the courthouses 
across the southeast after the courthouses had been burned. And it goes all into railroad leases, uh, all the city leases, all the municipality uh, leases, and, and so many things. And, but once you get past page uh, 400, 450 or so, it kind of goes, it kind of gets real hard to understand. My dad enjoyed this book also, but he said the same thing. Man, you know, the ending of the book, is, it's, it's like over three, 780 pages. So there's a lot there that you don't even have to go through. But, and here's, uh, I got two uh, Fletcher Prouty books. Now, Fletcher Prouty, he, uh, he, he died in, what, 2000, 2001 or so, and he was uh, uh, the chief of special operations uh, for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of President uh, KFJ. And he was all about trying to, uh, to keep the, uh, the AIC clowns in check. And, and a lot of his, most of his books on the shelf back in the early 70s, they were, they were removed. And it's just by luck that we have some of these reprints out. But he was a big critic of the AIC. And, and he, he tried, and, but, um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more on him later. Uh, because I've got this book here, see, uh, uh, um, President K, uh, KFJ right here. And there's a quote in this book concerning the AIC that is just absolutely unbelievable. He gives us the cure. And that's what I like about that. I like the guy. And he's a good writer. And so anyway, that is showing you uh, the books that I'm actually not using in this presentation, but have been read several times in order to provide you with the information. I'm going to apologize for the primitive and crude methods I have to use in, in filming these old books. Uh, uh, it, it's just a, a nightmare. I don't have a lot of equipment, but I do have access to equipment. And I'm like, what, well, if I had millions of dollars worth of equipment, how much different would it be? So it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Now, what first we're going to look at is, uh, is uh, the bookends here, these bookends. These are the most beautiful bookends in the world, in the world. And I'll tell you who that is. I made these. This is God and Harry working in tandem. These are serpentine ricolite. I uh, harvested, man, uh, uh, mined it, and, and, and this is one of my favorite minerals. One of my favorite minerals, and it just it, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And that's, how, uh, that's what these bookends are here. Very special. And they are probably for sale. <laughs> but anyway, right here, I'm showing you the collection of my books that are signed. That I'm going to be showing you that are signed. And these three books here in the, in the front, they're signed. But they're not really signed like the rest of the books. So I'm going to show them here. I'm going to show them here because, you see, my dad has put his name on them. And any, my, my uh, library was like a candy store for my dad. And he knew that any book I had in there, if he wanted it, he could get it. He, he could take it with him and, and have it as long as he wanted. But he did that with uh, my mom, too. Well, he did that with my mom. Now, this one right here, I'm just going to pull out. And we're going to see here. Here's his name here. He was called Hub. And this is a book that uh, was written by this guy right here. And very good book, very good book. And the reason I believe that he had these two books here that he had, you know, written his, it's on the bottom too. He, he wrote his name on the bottoms also. And, and because these two books here, uh, The Iron Curtain Over America and The Thirteenth Tribe, you have to read these together. And, and this is unusual, which there are other book sets that I've got. Uh, this is written in the 50s. Uh, this is written in the 60s, 70s or something. Uh, um, and you have to read them together. Read a chapter in here. Read a chapter in here. Read a chapter in here or two because you can't put it down. And then read the same two or three chapters in here. And you have to follow this out. And, and, and I told my dad that. And he just fell in love 
with these two books. He just fell in love with them. Now I'm just going to cruise through some of these that are signed. I've already explained these right here that were signed by my dad. I, I got a bad smudge. That's one of the reasons I like to wear gloves. For Harry, with best regards from Eustace Mullins. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, and here, right here, uh, another Jack Moore. With warmest regards, Jack Moore. I'll take it. I'll take it. And uh, this book. This next book is going to be one of the main highlight books of this presentation. And uh, uh, it's a sign. And, and I, I paid $2.50 for it. And the cheapest I can find that on this book online, and you'll notice it's less than a quarter of an inch. It's like an eighth of an inch, maybe a tenth of an inch. And the cheapest I could find this book online now was $85. And they were like up, up to like two, three hundred dollars. And uh, there it is. Warmest regards, Jack Moore. I, I, I print my stuff out on labels. Here's another signed one by Jack Moore. Thanks for your friendship, Jack Moore. Mm hmm. There's another one. To a soldier for the king, Jack Moore. Here's a Eustace Mullins book. For Harry, with best regards, from Eustace Mullins, Melbourne. That's Melbourne, Florida, 1992. 1992. A Writ for Martyrs, and this is an excellent book. It's going to be a, a feature book, and basically, A Writ for Martyrs is, um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the book now, is Eustace Mullins figured that he might actually have a, an FBI file, you know, maybe a couple of pages on who he was, what he did, etc., etc., and he filed a Freedom of Information Act uh, uh, document to obtain what they had of information that they had on him dating back to the 50s. Very good book and I'm going to be using some quotes from that. Rape of Justice. For Harry with best wishes from Eustace Mullins, Melbourne, 1992. Here's a little book sandwiched in here. The Great Betrayal. General Welfare Clause of the Constitution, Eustace Mullins. And it's a great book. I'm not using it because I've got other stuff. For Harry, with, uh, with best regards uh, from Eustace Mullins. And I used to have several of these right here, and they were all signed. I think I had like five or six of them. And it's a great book. Great book for its time. 1991 is when it came out. For Harry with best wishes from Eustace Mullins, Melbourne, Florida, 1992. Here's another really controversial character here. Pastor Pete Peters, America the Conquered. America the Conquered. He's big into the Kenites. And there it is. Many thanks, Harry, for helping record the messages at our Florida gathering. May this book be used to help us once again to be a free people. That would have been 92, 93-ish, perhaps. It's another Eustace Mullins. Great book. Great book. And I used to have the uh, 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 an accompaniment, uh, uh, complimentary book to this book called The Poison Needle also covers some of the very same issues that are covered in this book. For Harry, with best wishes from Eustace Mullins, 
$19.92. And these Eustace Mullins books go for a pretty penny online, but they're and they're not even signed. Here's the second edition of The World Order by Eustace Mullins. For Harry, with my best wishes for a dedicated fellow patriot from Eustace Mullins, West Palm Beach, Florida, 1992. Now, I want to also say that Eustace Mullins, I had mentioned in one of my other videos that uh, uh, I knew his driver, his, his uh, chauffeur actually worked for me, uh, Frank, which I have some books from. And he stayed at my condo on the ocean in Cocoa Beach for about two weeks while he was, uh, while he was traveling around um, uh, Florida giving speeches back in 92. And some other people, some other uh, big time patriots also spent time at my condo because I didn't really live there. I wasn't there a lot. So uh, it was pretty much open for people to, to stay there. So anyway, that's just covering my signed books. Now I'm going to go a little bit further into uh, uh, the signed book section here. And I'm going to be using this book, this book, and this book in the main presentation. And that's that. Uh, out of all of these signed books, these are the only three that I'm going to be using. And I wanted to point this out. That in, the, uh, in the introduction, I, I didn't give uh, Murder by Injection a, uh, uh, a caption, but this book here has to do with vaccinations, but it also has to do with what happens to anti-vaxxers. And this book is written a long time ago. And uh, I just want to point that out that this is a great book and these are all signed, uh, not these three, they're, they're signed by my dad, but and I'm going to be showing another book too, signed by, by both my mother and my father. And uh, but anyway, these these books here, they're all signed, but I'm only using three of them. Man, I just love my bookends here. They are just so beautiful. And these are the classics that I am using in this presentation. Again. And we're going to start here with Tragedy and Hope, uh, 1966, and then we're going to jump back to 1945, to 1928, to 1890, and then we're going to start shooting forward to 1934, 1952, these two are from 64, 66, and this is 68, and then we get into the 70s here. Moving forward, got three from the 70s, and then we jump into the 80s, and then the 90s with this reprint here. Now let's see where we go with all this. Nice bookends. I sure do love them. Now we're going to look at Tragedy and Hope, and it's only about two and a half inches thick. It's over 1,300 pages. And we're going to be using several passages from this book. So now let's see what it says. Now we're going to jump right in to page 950 of this book. And bear in mind, this is 1966. There does exist and has existed for a generation an international Anglophile, what does that word mean? It means British, network, which operates to some extent in the way the radical right believes the communists act. Well, he's not disputing that. He knows how it operates. In fact, this network, which we may identify as the roundtable groups, has no aversion to cooperating with the communists or any other groups and frequently does so. I know of the operations of this network, see there he is, he's confirming it, because I have studied it for 20 years and was permitted for two years in the early 1960s to examine its papers and secret records, which we may look at a couple. I have no aversion to it or to most of its aims and have for much of my life been close to it and to many of its puppets, I mean instruments, instruments. We're going to keep scrolling down here. The roundtable groups have already been mentioned in this book several times. 
chapter 4, chapter 12, the roundtable groups were semi-secret discussion and lobbying groups organized by these fellows all as the Rhodes Trust under Cecil Rhodes. His money went to it. By 1915, roundtable groups existed in seven countries, including England, South Africa, my favorite, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and a rather loosely organized group in the United States. Um, the attitudes of the various groups were coordinated by frequent visits and discussions and by a well-informed and totally anonymous quarterly magazine, The Round Table. Well, we all know uh, who the publisher is. We'll look at the publisher of The Round Table, but all of the articles have no authorship credits. I mean, good articles, but there's no one taking any credit for them. But he's, calling, he's saying that they're written by Philip Kerr, and it first appeared in November 1910. Now, we're going to step back, and we're going to look at page 131. This association was formally established on February the 5th, 1891, when Rhodes and Steed organized a secret society. Well, how does he, if it's a secret society, and he knows exactly the date of the charter and the year, well, it's, I'm just saying, maybe he was part of it. In this secret society, Rhodes was to be the leader. And look at all these other guys that were in the circle of initiates. We have this guy, and we have this Lord right here. Mm -hmm. And then the outer circle of help, uh, the association of helpers. Association of helpers, yes. Round table organization. Thus, the central part of the secret society was established by March of 1891. But I don't guess it was too secret for this guy, was it? Moving forward to page 621. Accordingly, these points had to remain secret except for various trial balloons issued through the Times, that'd be the London Times, in speeches in the House of Commons or in Chatham House, in articles in the Round Table. Now we're moving up to page 854. And this doesn't have to do anything with the politics or the... We're just wondering how close he was. How close uh, Carol Quigley was to all this. As late as 1939, less than an ounce of uranium metal had ever been made in the United States. And then they had to, it was, they had to make tons of it. The pile of purified graphite with lumps of uranium all through it was built in a squash court under the west stands of Stag uh, Field, where football had been discontinued. Well, it, yeah, I guess it was pretty secretive there, wasn't it? I would say. The pile of graphite, shaped as a roughly flattened sphere about 24 feet in diameter, had over six tons of uranium in small scattered lumps distributed in a cube at its center. Did somebody tell him or did he actually see it? This pile operate, uh, operated on purified natural uranium in which the, two, the, uh, the U-238 was 140 times more powerful uh, than the U-235. To separate, get this, to separate the U-235 from U-238 by physical methods, four techniques were attempted on parallel paths. And I'll just let you look at that. So, uh, all these countries that, that, that got uh, the atomic bomb, I guess they could have uh, used Carol Quigley's book to, uh, to, to uh, launch their, uh, their laboratories, couldn't they? This is jumping over to the next page, 855. And I'm sure that some of my uh, um, fans with um, gold and silver would be interested in seeing this. Since copper for electrical connections was in such short supply, 14,000 tons of silver from the Treasury Reserve of American paper money was secretly taken from the Treasury vaults, although still carried publicly on the Treasury balance sheets and made into wiring for the Y-12 plant. From this plant came much of the 235 used in, a, in the Hiroshima bomb. That's 28 million pounds. 
if a mixture of the two isotopes, now remember this guy's a journalist, if a mixture of the two isotopes in the only available gaseous form of the unstable and violently corrosive uranium hexafluoride were pumped thus through 4,000 successive barriers with billions of holes, each not over four ten millionths of an inch, the mixture after the last barrier would be largely the U-235 form of the compound 90% pure. Well, how does he know these measurements? Was he a scientist? No. Let's scroll on down and show some more. Now I'm going to jump over to page 1276. And when I'm reading some of these books, I'm trying uh, to oftentimes see where the author is coming from. I want to try to uh, uh, see what is motivating them and see kind of where they stand on certain issues and with Carol Quigley he's all over the place but it's page 1276 this can be seen even in those groups like the Christian clergy who insisted that they were still clinging to the basic Christian tradition of our society they were doing no such thing but instead were usually offering us meaningless verbiage or unrealistic abstractions that had little to do with our desire to experience and live in a Christian way here and now. Head scratcher. I'm now going to show you um, some pages from the magazine, the round table here, and I'm going to highlight one, some specific passages in one of the articles. The round table is a cooperative enterprise conducted by people who dwell in the different parts of the British Commonwealth and whose aim is to publish once a quarter a comprehensive review of imperial politics, free from the bias of local party issues. To this is added a careful and impartial treatment of the outstanding international problems that affect the nations of the Commonwealth. The affairs of the round table in each portion of the Commonwealth are in the hands of local residents. Yes, just local residents are teaching us all about imperial politics, free from bias and local party issues. Yes, sir. Who are responsible for all the articles on the politics of their own country? It is hoped that in this way the round table serves to reflect the current opinions of all parts about imperial problems and at the same time to present a survey of them as a whole in the light of changing world conditions. So these local residents are going to enlighten us concerning changing world conditions and international problems and imperial politics. Whoosh! And sure enough, that none of the articles are, are have any names associated with them. But we will see some names concerning the people that print it. Macmillan and Company, Macmillan Company of Canada, Macmillan and Company uh, of Australia. Uh, here we go. Uh, uh, here's another Macmillan and Company, Macmillan and Company, USA, Canada. So evidently, um, some bum just comes in off the street and doesn't say anything, he just lays a manuscript down on the counter and, and tells uh, uh, Macmillan and Company that he needs this book to go out and be printed in English all over in these countries and distributed. And so, well, wouldn't you think that uh, Macmillan and Company would know who these guys were? I'm just asking. Now here's the table of contents. And it being a quarterly, the pages just roll over from one page to the next with each issue. Okay, and this is actually the second issue for 1945 and I'm going to just scroll down here let you see how they name their their articles and some of these articles are actually when you're seeing when you're reading the article you're actually like in the pit on the German side in the pit on the British side uh, and also in the trenches with Americans the only uh, uh, um, article I'm going to highlight right here is program of the fourth term and what this is doing is laying out what they want and how things are going for Roosevelt's fourth term. I'm just going to scroll down here show you March 1945 Macmillan and Company Limited. I'm sure these guys know who's I'm going to jump over to page 151 and now you're going to see 
how these elitists view our our uh, uh, our fighting forces, our our, our veterans, etc. And this is written by someone in the U.S. Okay. True, our casualty lists have been lengthening for some time, but the losses are spread out all over the country. That's a good thing, isn't it? Except in the precious circle which each casualty affects, the impact of these lists is surprisingly little. The names are in the paper. That is about all. That's all they care about. Think about that. Page 152. I love this. We are the victims of geography and of the plenitude of our own productive system. We're the victims of plenitude and a productive system. Oh, I'm such a victim. And right here, I love this. America's debt to her allies. And I'm going to show you in a book down the road here what America's debt to her allies is. We're going to look at that debt. We're going to look at it real close. Now I'm going to jump over to page 154. Dumberton Oaks. Now the conference at Dumberton Oaks is where they ha where a bunch of elitists got together in, um, in uh, 1944 and they hammered out the foundations of what they were going to build the United Nations on. It is hard to realize that since the last of these articles was dispatched, both the American election and Dumberton Oaks have reached their climaxes. Of Dumberton Oaks, little need be said except that Americans regard the tentative agreements as a good if modest start. We can see our way to the ratification and implementation of these agreements. We could not see the possibility of going further, they got that wrong, at this time toward federalization or a world state or a world order. Perhaps we have fallen tragically short, but there is much reason, Americans believe, to think that events are following a logical and evolutionary course. The United Nations coalition is growing steadily and surely into a post-war peace alliance. That is precisely what we all want to happen. The growth is slow, but we have proved every foot of the way, and all of us hope that the next meeting of the Big Three or Big Four will take us into new terrain. It is about time that a United Nations Council came into permanent being. And this would have been actually uh, submitted in late 1944. And the United Nations uh, didn't get its charter until fall of 1945. So here you see this in print several months before the United Nations ever came into being. And this is where it came from.